So today I have a real privilege. I'm here at Degerfeld Flugplatz or Degerfeld Airfield here in Germany. And I'm looking at possibly the greatest warbird of World War II, the P-51 Mustang. The Mustang, the P-51, longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. A fighter pilot's dream. So this P-51D is the Louisiana kid. And it's with kind permission today from Wilhelm Heinz, the owner of this amazing aircraft that I've got this incredible access um, to be here and film with it today. So what we're gonna do, we'll go for a little bit of a, a walk around the aircraft and I'll tell you some, uh, some interesting points about it. So this is a P-51D. Um, you can tell that there's a couple of giveaway signs if you're not already familiar with Warbirds. So notice the like teardrop or bubble canopy. That was a feature specifically of the P-51D. Um, previous P-51 models had what was sort of known as a bird cage, um, a far more sort of metallic cockpit um, with uh, uh, metal loops going over it. And that really restricted the visibility um, for, for the pilots flying it and clearly flying a fighter aircraft. You need the best possible uh, visibility you could get. What they did do, um, as a bit of a stopgap measure for the P-51Bs and C models in um, very late December 1943, early 1944, was they um, used the Malcolm Hood, which was a British canopy, and they, they, they fitted those on to a lot of them, but it still wasn't good enough. So North America, oh sorry, North American Aviation redesigned the um, aft section of the fuselage. They dropped it down and then put this beautiful Perspex bubble canopy on it. And this gave those pilots flying the D variant of the Mustang incredible visibility because bar the headrest, they were able to turn around, look past it, and they could see completely behind their aircraft. And for those of you that know your aircraft, you can see the similarities between the P-51 of World War II to the F-16 Fighting Falcon of today, as they have very, very similar canopies. Um, so starting at the front then, the power plant of this amazing aircraft um, is a Packard Merlin V12. It's liquid cooled in line, and has 12 cylinders, as, as the name um, suggests with it being a V12. Originally, the Mustangs didn't have a Merlin up front. They used an Allison um, V1710 engine, and that was okay in the, in the Mustang A's, but what, what they found was um, low and medium altitude was okay, but much above 15,000 feet because of the way these aircraft and these engines breathe air, to enable the, the fuel air um, ratio to be correct for the combustion to develop the pressure they need to turn the prop. They found that above 15,000 feet, it just wasn't very good. Um, it didn't have the superchargers needed to develop that pressure. So its performance drop would be really noticeable. And clearly they needed an escort fighter to escort the B-17s and the B-24s deep into Europe to stop them getting um, massacred by the Luftwaffe. So the early Mustangs weren't really an option, but it was a New Zealander working for Rolls-Royce at Hucknall in Nottinghamshire, a guy called uh, Ron Harker. And he said, why not put one of the Merlin 60 series engines in the aircraft and see how it gets on? So they did that, they switched out the Allison, put in a Merlin a 61 engine to the uh, onto the Mustang, took it flying, and the performance um, change was huge. America and the USAF finally had a fighter that was capable of performing at the altitudes it needed, and the performance with the Merlin far exceeded anything that could be uh, hoped for. And that was for a couple of reasons. Firstly, if we come around here to the wing. So the first feature of the Mustang that enabled its high-speed performance was the wing. Now, it's a little hard to see from here, but developed by the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, and that, interestingly enough, was the forerunner to NASA, they designed the wing so that the drag 
generated by the air flowing over the wing was a lot less than its contemporary fight or the other contemporary fighters of World War II. So even things like the Spitfire with its well-known elliptical wing, this in technical terms, in aerodynamic terms, really was a better wing. So the second feature on the Mustang that gave it its edge was the oil and air coolant scoop. And that sits down here. So this scoop here holds the oil and the air coolant radiators. But what's really cool about this was when North American Aviation designed it, they put it right on the center line of the aircraft and it forms that well-known profile of the P-51. Now, if you look at the Spitfire Mark IX, um, which was the Royal Air Force's version of the P-51 um, at this stage in the war, underneath each wing, on both sides, it would have two big radiator scoops. They were doing the same job. But the problem with that was that's two big pieces of metal stuck out in the airflow and they're not adding a positive, uh, positive effect. They're just causing drag, but they're a necessary component because otherwise you can't cool the engine, um, you can't cool the oil, which then in turn would lead to your engine overheating and the thing seizing up, which no pilot needs. So North American Aviation, they put it on the center line and because you've got a load of air rushing in through this scoop here, as it goes through the radiators, it's cooled and then goes through the, the, the pipes, the air coming out the back was still quite hot and that in turn generated thrust. In fact, it generated enough thrust to overcome the drag created by this scoop here. Therefore, in a kind of way, it was acting almost like a little mini jet engine giving it just a little bit more thrust um, and giving it that edge when it came to being up at altitude and fighting against the Luftwaffe. So one thing that you might not be that familiar with, although it looks very similar, this is a P-51D because it was made in Inglewood, California, but there were some models during the war called a P-51K and the only difference was A, they were made in Texas and the P-51D from Inglewood in California used the Hamilton standard propeller. Now that's got a diameter of 11.2 foot, whereas the ones on the P-51K used the Aero Products propeller, and that was 11 foot, and it had real problems at full throttle with vibration, which um, if you know your aircraft, the last thing you want is your propeller to be um, vibrating in any way other than it's within its design limitations. So because of those problems, eventually all P-51s had the Hamilton standard propeller fitted. But it's just the D and the K variants were just based purely on the locations in which they were built. So the P-51 undercarriage um, has some really cool features about it. The fact that it's wide tracked meant that for both pilots and ground crew, ground handling operations, was quite straightforward. It was quite rugged. It could deal with um, operating on grass as easily as it could operating on tarmac. In here, as well, inside the actual undercarriage bays itself, these clamshell doors, when they're down, they create a physical interlock. So what that means is, um, in the cockpit with the undercarriage lever, if you were to accidentally kick it, there's, there's no way it could operate, A, because the hydraulic pressure has been dissipated, that's why the clamshell doors are down, and then because they are down, it creates a physical interlock, preventing that handle from being raised and the undercarriage retracting. So there's no risk of accidentally um, putting the undercarriage up whilst the aircraft's resting on the ground. Um, also as well, you've got the fold down landing light, and just generally, it's really straightforward but rugged technology. So these aircraft, um, despite it looking like sort of quite thin and um, not as big as say the B-17, these things could operate off rough airfields and cope with it quite easily. So then moving around, the actual war fighting capability of the P-51 Mustang was its six 50 caliber machine guns. Now, because we're here in Germany, and because it's not World War II anymore, um, these, uh, it doesn't have 
real 50 cals fitted or even deactivated ones, but it's still got the gun ports there. Um, but during World War II, initially the P-51Bs and Cs had um, just two 50 cals in each wing, so only four total. But then as the aircraft developed and it was realized that just a little bit more firepower was needed, they managed to squeeze an extra 50 cal into each wing so that the rate of fire coming out of this, although they weren't cannons, they were still machine guns. So we didn't pack the full punch of say 20 millimeters at 300 yards or 250 yards, wherever the guns were um, zeroed in, wherever they were designed for the maximum amount of rounds to impact a target in front of the aircraft, they could still do a lot of damage. And they did by shooting down a vast amount of the Luftwaffe. So moving around the aircraft then, it's a sort of fairly standard configuration. Um, one cool thing with the control surfaces is it's got this servo tab here, which um, servo trim tab, it acts as part of the trimming system for the aircraft. So unlike the Spitfire, which didn't have um, aileron trim tabs, so the pilot constantly had to be on the stick, ensuring that it was um, maintaining level flight if that was what was required. With the P-51, you can trim it in all three axes. So pitch, roll, and in yaw. So that basically means that the pilot takes hands completely off. And as long as it was trimmed for um, that part of the flight, for the speed that it was traveling at, it, it could be completely hands-free. Now, clearly as a fighter pilot in World War II, you wouldn't do that for very long, but it did just relieve some of that pilot workload. Um, and we'll see that later on in the cockpit. Um, coming back here then, you've got the, the flaps. Flaps are designed to increase the lift at slower speeds. And these were really good. Um, it went from obviously completely raised, so zero degree flaps, um, 10, 20, all the way through to 50 degrees. And what that meant was the pilot could use those flaps um, potentially in combat to increase their turn radius um, in a turning fight with 109s or 190s. And they could put down um, up to like 20 degrees of flaps without, as long as they didn't exceed 275 miles an hour, they could have 20 degrees of flaps and really bring the, um, the turn radius into the aircraft, which in a, in a gunfight, when you're trying to get a gun solution, um, was really important. Um, along here, you've got your access panel and your uh, to the guns, and then your um, access panel for where the ammunition would go. Now, you'll often hear people say, um, oh yeah, the whole nine yards, and it refers to the length of 50 cal rounds um, for, for a Mustang. Um, as far as I can tell, no one's ever actually been able to prove that. It sounds cool, but I think it's a load of BS personally. Um, here, you've got your um, fuel tank for the, uh, for, this, uh, for the left wing tank. Same on the, on the right as well. In each wing, you've got a 92 gallon tank in each wing. If this P50, P51D was at wartime spec, it would also have an 85 gallon tank behind the pilot seat here. But this one doesn't, it's had its removed. Moving back, you've got your, um, your foot step plate and your handhold there for gaining access up onto the aircraft. And then as we make our way further back, and if you look at P51Bs and Cs compared to the D, you can really see that they dropped the back of the fuselage down on the D, made it a lot more streamlined. And um, in my opinion, it's the best looking version of the Mustang. Now coming down here, as I said earlier about the air scoop, um, this was the, uh, the, the door for it. And when it's in this open position, and all the controls on this, by the way, for this system, they can be controlled manually by the pilot if he needs to um, either increase or decrease the um, coolant temp and the oil temperature. And you can see that on the gauges, but for the most part, there was a um, thermostat in there and this was controlled automatically. So considering this was designed in 1940, um, it's quite, quite cool technology for back in the day. Um, but it was out here that you would get that little bit of extra thrust enough to overcome the drag of the um, scoop at the front. So this was a big part of the Mustang's um, uh, war winning advantage. So moving back then, you've got the rear tail wheel. Now on the Spitfire, the Spitfire's tail wheel was free castering. So what do I mean by that? Well, essentially you had no control over it. If it was pointing um, 
sort of straight up and down on the aircraft, the Spitfire would go forward. If it was turned at an angle, then the aircraft would be pivoting in to whichever degree the tailwheel was sat at. The tailwheel on the Mustang though, the pilot could pull the stick back ever so slightly in the cockpit and that would lock the tailwheel and then you would have six degrees freedom of movement either side. So that was great for, again, for ground handling operations because it meant that the pilot had real control um, when taxiing, whereas the Spitfire you had to be really, really careful um, on the, um, it used a, a, a brake lever on the stick and then you had to use the rudder pedals at the same time. Whereas the Mustang uses what a lot of pilots I think would find more conventionally um, toe brakes independent. So operating the disc brakes on the wheels, if you wanted to go left, you would just tap down on the left toe, uh, left rudder pedal, that would break the left wheel and you would go round to the left. Of course, if you needed it to be free castering because you needed to make a really tight turn, you just push the stick forward, unlock the wheel, and then it'll turn on a sixpence. Coming further back then, um, you've got the elevators, a big counterbalance here on the, um, on the elevators themselves with the trim tabs. And of note, metal elevators, the earlier ones had um, canvas covered ones, but these were um, aluminium covered. You've got the vertical fin or the rudder. Interestingly, this is um, fabric covered, but again, a massive, um, massive trim tab there. And again, a counterweight here at the very top. One point of note on this aircraft that's quite cool and a lot of Mustangs don't have these anymore, but I don't know if you can see this with the camera, but underneath here, this was the relief tube for the pilot. So if you've got a five, six hour mission um, on board this aircraft, it's not like a modern airliner where you can get up, go for, uh, go for a rest break and then come back to the cockpit. The pilots were sat there for five, six hours at a time. So they had a relief tube. So if they needed to go for a pee, they would use a tube up front and then it would exit the aircraft at the very back there. Um, was we welcome around because it's, it has to meet modern EU um, safety regulations that all um, civilian aircraft do or all aircraft do. Uh, this P-51 has got um, modern communication suite fitted and that's what these antennas are at the back here. Okay, so coming around this side of the aircraft then, you've got basically the same setup as um, on the other side. Um, interesting point to note here, we've got a jacking point here um, if the ground crew would need to raise the tail of the aircraft to um, bring it up to do either any maintenance work or if they were to say zero the guns on the ground, they'd raise the tail, make sure all the guns were towed into a certain point. And, and by that, I mean, they harmonize the guns to a certain range and they're taking down the firing butts and ensure that everything was aligned both horizontally and vertically as well. So that whenever there was an enemy aircraft in the pilot's gun sight at say 300 yards, it would, all of the rounds would impact at that point if he was at the right distance. And then coming around, again, we've got the other 92 gallon fuel tank here, the access panels for the 350 cows that would be in the right wing, and then the ammunition access points as well. And then on this side, the only real difference is that we don't have on the underside of the left-hand wing is the pito probe. And that probe there is designed so that you can accurately measure the airspeed of the aircraft. Um, and in the cockpit, there's a little switch so that when you're at altitude to stop that thing from freezing up and giving you inaccurate um, readings on your airspeed, um, it actually heats itself up so that it, it stays free so that the air pressure coming in there can then give an accurate reading to the pilot in the cockpit so he knows exactly how fast he's going. So I hope you've really enjoyed this walk around the iconic and really impressive P51D Mustang. I will see you all in the next one.